the primary purpose of our conversation, and it is a conversation, it's not a presentation, is to talk about what it was like to be at that first board meeting in 2013 when we sat as a, direct, as a board of directors of approximately seven, eight people at the time and mapped out the future which largely grew into a multi-billion dollar company. Dr. Levenger is a preeminent otolaryngology surgeon. He has, was with the Summit Medical Group for a number of years before assuming senior roles as the chief exec chairman and chief executive officer. He has had a variety of different experiences as a founding director of the group itself, founding director of the holding company, which, will, which uh, is the Summit Management Group and also is called Zuni for reasons we can talk about, and ultimately uh, sold to Warburg Pincus in 2019, or at least 60% of Warburg Pincus 2019. Um, to become Summit Health. But Dr. Lebenger is a, is a world-class uh, physician in his own right, but from my observations, one of the true skill sets that he brings is the ability to optimize the governance, management, and operations in a way that provide shareholder value, and at the end of the day, created an enterprise value that is really almost unsurpassed and quite, and quite frankly, unequaled in the physician practice management business, and we'll, we'll tell that story today. Dr. LeBenger, how, how did you get the idea to create Summit and the Summit Health Project? Uh, first, I want to thank you for having me here. Second, if you don't understand Brooklyn, um, I apologize. <laughs> okay, I do mumble sometimes, so I apologize. <clears throat> so I was a trained uh, physician. I came out of Mount Sinai in 1989. I was a head and neck surgeon, and I started uh, my practice in, at the time, the largest group practice in New Jersey, which was 45 providers at the time. By the time we did our capitalization, uh, which was three years ago, we grew to 1,000 providers, and now we're 2,700 providers in the entire New York metropolitan uh, area. Um, I used to believe it or not, I think this is key to why we were successful is that I am still an operating physician. I still operate, I still do head and neck surgery, and I think that you have to have skin in the game with your company to be able to prove to your constituents or your providers or whoever's in your company that you are part of that family, part of that group that makes that company successful. Uh, the other thing that I could tell you, and we could talk about a little later, is really important when you grow a group with your management team is you have to have utmost trust in your providers and the providers have to have utmost trust in the management to do the right thing for that company. And that goes with culture and mission and vision of your company to be able to drive it to where you want to drive it to. And for us in our marketplace, it was to create a healthcare delivery model with great outcomes, high quality, and lowering the macroeconomic uh, value or cost you know, of that healthcare delivery model. So that's where we are you know, presently at 2,700 physicians merging with a company called CityMD, which is a convenient urgent care business line, which probably was, and I could go into the detail of that, but it, brought, it had a lot of in, um, industrial logic bringing us together uh, to manage the patient you know, in the continuum of care of access and delivery. But I will turn it over to Jack because we have a lot to discuss here. And I could, it's my passion, so I could, I could talk about Summit Health forever. So I will. So, so right off the bat, it. so right off the bat, you see, you see a chairman and a CEO with significant technical knowledge as well as passion, as well as drive and, and, and enormous credibility. So most of the time when you look at physician organizations, they fail because they focus on income, not equity appreciation. One of the things that was critical in the early period of starting Summit was a philosophy related to equity and income. What would you, how, how, would, you, how would you share with the group how we balanced some of those, those, those challenging contradictions? Right, well a couple things. One, physicians, at least in my little world, physicians always look at income. They don't understand equity. They don't understand wealth enhancement in the future. They look at you operate 
or you see a patient, you get a reimbursement, you get income. And when you have a large group and you have a large management company, I always spoke to the physician base. We always had group meetings. I said there is a value to management and there is a value, an economic value of that management team that can be capitalized in the future. So other than just chin to chin time seeing a patient uh, and getting an economic value on that, then there is other uh, avenues where you could accrete value. Now, hopefully I'm altruistic and I'm empathetic and that's one of the reasons why I became a physician. And I do, that's why I love to see a patient and have patient care. But in the reality, you have to turn on the lights and you have to pump the gas and there is an economic value to survive in this world. And I always felt that there was another avenue for the physicians to accrete an economic value. So given that premise that there is already an administrative cost to running a physician organization, and it ranges anywhere from 20 to 60% in, in, in most environments, the ability to create a business out of that administrative element was at the heart of creating what we called in the early, early days, Topco. It became Summit Management and it later became Zuni. But at the end of the day, not at the end of the day, it, it, as a critical element in that uh, creation of value related to administration, Jeff was able to communicate to the doctors that that administrative function could do things in ways that they individually couldn't do things as well. And probably one of the key breakthroughs in that early period of 2013, 2014, 2015 was to work with both the payers and adjacent delivery systems in relationship to contract remuneration for providing a value-based care reimbursement. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because at the time, that was a, a, a really different concept. Right. So we, so at Summit uh, Medical Group at the time, now Summit Health, uh, we, believe it or not, were out of network with the largest payer in the state, which was the Blue Shield Blue Cross contract, because the reimbursement level was so low. And that was one of the um, hindrances that we had uh, with growth, because when we went to see physicians and we tried to grow the practice site, they really cared about patient abandonment because they felt that they would lose their uh, Blue Shield Blue Cross patients and, and they did not want to join the group, even though without that contract, economically for them, they would actually do better economically because of our rate structure with the other payers. And we had enough volume to sustain it. But I knew at the time for us to grow and for the growth for the physician base to be happy about coming into the group, we had to have that contract. And it's all a volume play. It always is a volume play. So I didn't look at the unit cost. I really looked at uh, gaining the volume of the growth coming in. And we were able to construct a contract with the blues at the time that were able to remunerate, maybe not as great as what we would have hoped, but the day that we got that contract, we went from, in, four, in three to four years, we went from 150 providers to over 600 providers on that growth. And it was you know, the accretion of the volume that really sustained us and were able to let us grow. And we could get into it further, but for our economic value, we were always pretty heavily managed in the group. From one, you could just imagine, from 150 to 600 providers, our corporate overhead might have gone up total maybe 5%. So you could imagine what that accreted to the bottom line and to the EBITDA you know, of the company. Um, so those are some of the aspects. So, so the theme here, which I think is going to be a common theme for many companies sitting around the table or sitting around our, our, our conference, is scope and scale. At the end of the day, we started with a very focused, relatively small group that had a concept related to administrative accretion and value-based 
reimbursement that was, again, somewhat unique, that needed to facilitate scope and scale, a payer that, for all intents and purposes, wanted to support scope and scale, and a medical group that was able, under the leadership of Dr. LeBenger and the management team, to essentially attract physicians into that model in a way that had never been done before. And, and I, I say that very specifically. Many, many hospital systems, and we may have some hospital systems in the room, but at the end of the day, hospital systems and large health plans have been buying physicians for long periods of time. And they've been losing large amounts of money for long periods of time. This was the largest accretive acquisition streak of physicians, five, 600 physicians in four or five years, that had ever occurred in the physician practice management industry. So Dr. LeBenger, using scope and scale, was able to then take the monies that had been accreted and start to look at additional differentiation strategies. Well, I, I just wanted to say one other thing. When you are negotiating or when you are growing, you, I always look across the table, and I sometimes negotiate against myself. I try to be as open, blunt, and, and fair as possible. And when you are trying for growth and you are, have a business partner, and I looked at Horizon, which is the Blue Shield Blue Course company, as my partner, not my adversary, you know, when you're trying to grow. And when you really flip it and you look at it that way, then it changes the dynamic of the negotiation or the relationship to get to the end point where you have to get to. And my father told me a long time ago, it's better to get 50%, 50 cents rather than zero cents. So, you know, when you negotiate and when you look at, you know, to uh, try to uh, manage uh, the growth in your company, you have to look at a partnership rather than an adversary relationship even though you know that they are looking at you, and most payers look at the provider adversarially, but it, you really have to step back and take a real different look at the situation when you're negotiating with somebody. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's just perfect. Off on that. And, and, and that, that, that basically bled over into the relationship with your physicians. Correct. The physician uh, participation piece was critical. So we always come back to, okay, well, how did you fund this new company? How much money did it take? How, did it, how was it competitive in relationship to other companies, quite candidly, that had failed? And how much money was it costing to expand? And were you actually buying market share as opposed to really growing market share? And several key elements became apparent. Number one, the first raise um, with the original group of investors was, were only partners at the Summit Medical Group with a couple independent directors who were serving on the board, and we can come back to that in a, in a little bit. And that raise was $20 million. And it was a relatively small raise given, again, the size of, of what we were trying to do. That, that, those monies were largely used to backstop the overhead and necessary uh, improvements that Summit was trying to do. And obviously, there was a cost to acquiring physicians at different points in the business cycle. The second raise was for about $50 million about three years later. And that was the last raise before literally Summit became a unicorn about five years later, about five years later. So you say to yourself, how could you possibly grow an organization of this size with so little capital raise? And the answer is, you use that accretion of efficiency related to administration and the reimbursement structure for the contracts of the physicians as attraction components so that the physicians would buy in to the entire business model in a different way than simply working for a hospital or an insurance company or a non-physician organization. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, so in, at least in the New York New Jersey metropolitan marketplace, physicians really do not want to work for a hospital system unless you're an academic. Uh, but they do go there for security. We were large enough that we offered the physician the security on the economic side. But when you are managed, one of the differences between us and a system 
is that you weren't managed by a suit in the hospital. You were actually managed by a physician management company. And we had physician managers and, and uh, clinicians managing uh, the physician base. So I think that was a, you know, a big difference you know, in the growth structure of, of, of the group. In terms of the capitalization of the group and the growth of the group, it was really trust in the management and trust and understanding about our growth. And we actually had group meetings where I absolutely fostered once a month everybody to pile into our cafeteria. There were three, 400 people in our cafeteria. So everybody met, everybody understood, everybody felt they were part of a family and they knew we were tracking. They knew that this was all about patient care and all about creating a healthcare delivery model. And I think that's really, if you really follow your passion, your mission and your vision of your company and, you, and that's pervasive and it goes throughout the entire organization, I think the growth you will see, and I don't want to be naive about it, but you will see the growth. And I don't want to be naive about it that they also look at the economic value of coming into the group. I mean, we always were about 25 to 50 percent higher in terms of uh, income that a physician would receive compared to the outside. It's because we were able to scale and we were able to negotiate and we were able to reimburse at a better rate. So we're able to, scale, you know, to grow you know, a little quicker than on the outside. And when you're able to grow, it just is exponential you know, on itself. Uh, that's how we grew and that's how we were able to, uh, let's say, subsidize a lot of the practices within the group on ramp, because when you bring groups in, there is a ramping time where they're not bringing in income that you have to guarantee or give them income to be able to have that growth. And I think that's how we're able to achieve that. So the ramp concept, whether it's with a physician practice management organization, whether it's with a digital health plan, whether it's with a mRNA company, uh, an AI company, whatever, is, is, is a real challenge. Because managing that ramp, if you are not profitable too long, for too long of a period, you run out of money before you are successful, even with the most successful model that, that can be introduced at the time. One of the things that was very unique about Summit, and I'd like Dr. Lavenger to comment on it, is that there were two major boards. There was a fiduciary board, which ran the holding company, and that fiduciary board was still dominated by, by Summit physicians. It was chaired by Dr. Lavenger. There was also a lead director involved, but there were three independent directors, and those three independent directors largely ran the committees that lead themselves to independent directors, the compensation committee, for instance, the audit committee, other committees that essentially look to independent outside expertise. That was purely fiduciary, but it clearly had an understanding of the business and the physician need. The medical group, the physician medical group, the summit medical group, had a summit board, and that summit board was very, very, very clinically focused. And it was not worried about the EBITDA and the finances. It was worried about cost and value and a variety of other things, but it was very much focused on what physicians are focused on, which is the quality of care issue Dr. Lavenger mentioned. How do, how do you think the interaction of those two governance structures help the, the, the success of the model? Yeah, well, I think the success, the underlying success was that the owners or the shareholders of the management company, when we broke that out, and the PA, the physician practice, were one of the same. They were the same ownership, same mission and vision and values as the holding company, the management company, and the physician practice. So we had very similar construct of where we wanted to drive the business model. There wasn't an opposition and a sort of a tug and a war between management and the clinical model. And I think it was important that we always ran the group because the physicians that were on the board were, and they had the control of the board, were physicians. And the clinical model was sacrament. I mean, that was the lifeblood of the group, how we ran 
our clinical model, how we saw the patient, how we delivered the care, how we looked at outcomes, how we looked at value. And that was purely run by physician management in the group. They reported up to the fiduciary report board, but there were still nine members. Six of those members on that fiduciary board were physicians within that company. So they had the same mission, vision, and sort of the values to control the healthcare delivery model, and I think that was very important. So one of the other themes that, that was unusual in this particular environment, and perhaps not as unusual in some other life sciences environments, was the focus, again, on not returning um, revenue to shareholders, but basically increasing equity value. And I keep coming back to this because at the end of the day, the equity appreciation for Summit um, is, is, quite frankly, one of the all-time largest uh, equity returns probably in the history of, 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 of certainly a startup and even, even within a mature company of a billion dollars or more. But we're talking about multiples and 20, 30, 40x type of returns. We minimized income to every level, the board, the management, and the physicians to the degree we could and incentivized the equity participation through a variety of different stock structures, which again were very thoughtful in nature related to the participation of the different individuals involved, whether you were a practicing physician, uh, a, a member of the management team or C-suite, the chairman of the board, the board of directors, et cetera. That, that equity uh, strategy could have gone two ways. If the equity had not appreciated significantly, um, as the head of the compensation committee, which is what my role was, I probably would have been sued by a whole variety of people along with Dr. Lavenger. If it did go well, we were, we, we, were, we were heroes. So at the end of the day, fortunately, we turned out to be heroes as opposed to the opposite, but there was a discrete strategy to make it very clear to the physicians and the management team that they were investing in their future and their value and wealth creation was, again, not income-focused, but equity-focused. So as a result, how come we didn't need to go and raise more money before we reached that billion-dollar level? So one of the things that in the evolution of uh, Summit uh, Medical Group is that we were always pretty it was, I don't want to say it was easy, but we were able to compensate our physicians fairly well, and we used to give out, at the end of the year, uh, you know, bonuses to our physicians and to move it. But what we did, when you look at business models and you look at liquidity events and you look at bringing a capital structure to the group, you know, a private equity or whatever is going to look at what's called the scrape or how you move dollars from the PA into the management or into the holding company. And it was pretty easy for us to do that and to try to explain to the physician what that might mean in terms of equity value rather than income. And I think it took a long time to explain to the base what the difference is between income and equity you know, in a company. And the physicians, I would say, maybe 10% really understood it. Probably another 40, 50% might have grasped it a little bit. The rest had no idea. Um, but I think it was that evolution of the education. It took a lot of education for them to understand really, you know, what that meant and how to accrete, you know, an equity value of the group. But when you own your own business, and these physicians and uh, these providers own their own business, they were not afraid, and this is what I think w was one of our successes. They were never afraid to reinvest into the company for the company to grow. And I remember one year on reinvestment, I had to take, it's a fair amount, 7% of income from the physicians to reinvest in the company because of what we discussed before, a little bit of the ramp of the company. So they, they sort of were getting it that when you reinvest in the company, one or two years later, 
it exponentially grows in the value of your company because of the ramp and bringing in the new business that might come into the company. And then they start to think, wow, you could do that, and then what does it mean for you know, the uh, liquidity or for the you know, equity side rather than the income side? So it's something that takes a long time to educate to be able to achieve that within the organization. So in the seven years it took to grow from virtually a non-company to a billion dollar plus company unicorn, obviously you can't have had uh, a linear line that just was all successes. What were some of the failures or less than optimal uh, periods or decisions that, that we had to deal with in relationship to ultimately getting to that successful milestone but still having some challenges in, the, in, the, in, the, in, that, in that ramp? Uh, let me think about this, because there's one thing that, as the CEO, uh, well, I go back to my training as a surgeon. My training as a surgeon is that, yes, mistakes are made, but I was taught by probably the uh, most famous head and neck surgeon in the world at the time, Hugh Biller at Mount Sinai. And when he was training me, he said, look, you're going to make a mistake. I'm going to train you how to get out of a mistake, and don't hop on your mistake. And that really stuck with me because, you know, we've made, you know, some mistakes. We made, you know, with the payers, with hospital relationships, with uh, some growth within the company. But my team always knew. They always joked about it. You know, I don't have a rear view mirror. I took it off and I chucked it. I never look in the rear because if you make a mistake, you understand it and you move forward. But when you are really trying to grow a company, understand what ha has happened in the past, but you don't hop on it, you don't look back, because what happens when you do that, and I don't mean to sound like an arrogant ass, I'm sorry, but you don't, you don't want to become too risk adverse, because in the business, if you become too risk adverse, and you think about what you did in the past, you're never going to take a, a baby step or a step forward to be able to create what you want to create. So in, in that process, you, you're basically saying to the group, and, and, and you've said to me historically, you fail fast. If you're going to fail, and you can see that what you've decided on isn't working, you fail fast, you change direction, and you fundamentally take advantage of the learnings from, from that opportunity. Um, I think you know you hear that all the time from from people who, who fund private equity and who fund venture capital and a variety of other things. But at the same time that you were um, creating a ramp to grow and scale, and there were some ups and downs, but more, hopefully not hopefully, but uh, genuinely many more ups than downs. There obviously were some innovations that that took place. The ability to grow the physicians very rapidly was one of them the ability to use um, compensation structures with equity very creatively was another. You also did something that was way ahead of its time, and that was providing the right care at the right place at the right time uh, at the right cost. And that took on a number of manifestations that seem common today, such as urgent care centers, such as cancer centers, such as uh, putting physicians into hospital settings that were your own physicians. How do you look back on some of those innovations that were clearly before their time, and how important were they to the growth of the business? Right. It was, it was really important. I remember in the early 90s, you know, managed care was coming mainly to California, you know, with the HMOs and how to manage patients, and it really was not in New Jersey. New Jersey was a real fee-for-service fiefdom, and it was growing on a fee-for-service. and we actually hired a woman, uh, a nurse, out of a California company who understood value-based care and management. And we started to learn from that, because there's one insurance company that unfortunately went bankrupt because they didn't understand risk corridors. But we went with them, and we were their best provider. You know, I don't know if you understand bed days or, or ER visits, but we were about 50 to 70 percent better than anybody else. And it wasn't because we did anything better. 
we, had, we were integrated in our healthcare model. We had one EHR, we had one chart. So we always you know, looked at that. And we, we really learned from that. And as we moved along, I always felt that you have to have a value proposition in healthcare because you want to create a unit cost you know, for you on a reimbursement side from the insurer. Because it, it really isn't, everything is based in a fee-for-service world out there. I don't care what anybody says, it's based, you do a service, you get paid. What they do, they do in a construct of a total cost of care. So you're gonna get paid on a unit cost no matter what, but you have to do it where the total cost, when you bring in all the little, from ambulatory surgery to imaging to lab to this to that on the patient, that overall cost is gonna be lower than what the marketplace is. And that's how we always try to manage to lower the cost to the marketplace. So we were able to do that as we moved across into the ambulatory you know, field. You know, most healthcare, as you know, is 95% is as an outpatient. You don't have to go to a hospital. A hospital is really for ICU care or for quaternary tertiary surgical care that is needed, but all health care you know, could be done on the outside. And that's how we tried to structure the group to bring our economic uh, value to the, uh, to the ambulatory sector. So as, as Summit grew and the number of physicians grew and the holding company revenue grew, the medical group revenue grew, obviously the valuation followed. As you got closer and closer to the seven year point and the point where your valuation was in excess of a billion dollars, how did you start to think about the next level of market capitalization and who you were going to partner with to go from right. a billion to multiple billions of dollars? So, you know, it was interesting. I really did not want to go to private equity. I was never a private equity guy. I knew that we had a company, we had a lot of white space, we could continue to grow. We were growing off our debt, which was based on our AR and some unoperational cash. And we were paying dividends and we were doing really well, increasing our stock price. Um, what happened is that the board, you know, had, we had a realization that our data analytics was going to have to improve. And we probably, to support the group, we were going to have to grow a little quicker in primary care attribution to bring more patients into the group. And we were looking at that point for a capital partner. Uh, we did not do a wholesale look at a capital partner. I went to one capital partner, and that was it, because I tried for years to get, I don't know if you heard of a company called CityMD, but they are the largest, they were the largest independent uh, urgent care or convenient care business in the country. And they had a model that was just phenomenal. They had a run of a model, and I don't mean to get, waste too much time on this, but when you came in to see CityMD, it was a 25 minute visit, you were out, but they had physicians that ran a business called Aftercare that looked at every incidental, every lab, they looked at the patient thoroughly, you know, from what was said, and they referred it to where it had to go and managed that patient. There was no other urgent care business that did this. And I looked at the industrial logic of bringing a multi-specialty with an access point to medicine, and in New York metropolitan area, they were throwing out between 400 and 500,000 referrals a year. So I looked at how to bring this together to create a healthcare delivery model of integrative care uh, within the entire New York metropolitan area. And that it was the reason why we looked at one PE firm, because they already owned, or they were the capital partner, had the rights to CityMD. So when we looked at our liquidity event, it was, for me, it was a little different. Yes, the economic value was there, but it was the industrial logic of bringing the two companies together to create something. So when you look at the right capital partner, you have to really dig deep and see really what you're going to give up, what you're going to get, and how you're going to create the vision and the mission that you really want to have to be able to achieve it. So in doing that, what did that capital partner require of the physicians to continue to participate considering how important their role was in the business model? You know, I, I, I could tell you that uh, Warburg Pincus, which was our capital partner, they brought process to the equation. You know, I was never a 
cost guy. I'm always a revenue guy. I always thought revenue trumped everything. And I let the cost, you know, we had an efficiency office or whatever. But what they did bring is an economic efficiency model and a process model to look at your company a little differently and to look at the value proposition a little differently. And I would just tell you when you want when you go do that, you just have to sort of be careful. One of the things that we fought about uh, when we were looking at this, and which is, I, again, I'll say it again, Sacrament, is that our clinical model cannot be touched by, uh, it's like our Ten Commandments, it cannot be touched by the private equity. So how we ran our business, how we ran our model was put into our operating agreement that we had when we came together you know, with, this, with the private equity group. Because no matter what, I don't care what anybody says, the private equity is gonna to wanna to get out in four, uh, four to seven years, and they're gonna put some screws to the company to increase the EBITDA growth. And I'm not saying that it, it has a direct, you know, clash with what you're going to do, but when it might, because my, my goal was always to create a healthcare delivery model and to give a quality outcome to a patient. That is of utmost importance. But how you get there could be interesting. So, so given that interesting aspect, which almost always pops up, the board, and I'm now talking about the Summit Topco Fiduciary Board, we felt strongly both as independent directors and as the physicians on the board that literally there had to be safeguards related to the C-suite and to the management, in particular the CEO, Dr. LeBenger. And literally there was a 95% approval requirement to remove the management, specifically the CEO, from that role. And I believe that was a critical uh, point, critical leverage point in allowing Dr. LeBenger to continue to manage Summit successfully. So now we're sitting here in 2019, I believe 60% or some percentage close to that of Summit was, was, was sold to Warburg. Again, valuation over a billion, way over a billion dollars. And COVID hits. How does Summit respond to the COVID pandemic, especially being Northeastern based and being in New York? We were the largest provider of service for COVID patients in the New York metropolitan area. I think we saw over 6 million patients in our city MD and our urgent cares coming through in COVID. Uh, so what it meant uh, is good and bad. If you were in physician integrated practice, you saw what happened. Virtual visits went up, visits went down, you know, in-person visits went down. The profitability and the revenue streams of of practice management came down considerably. We, on the other hand, were pretty lucky. I'm fortunate for the patient with COVID, but we saw, as I just said, the most COVID patients in the New York metropolitan area. What that afforded us to do is it, 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 it boosted our revenue, it boosted our profitability, and what we did is we took out for the last two to three years, close to $200 million per year in CapEx to grow the company. So we added almost uh, between five and 600 million over the past three years in CapEx to the company to grow our company so we could perform at the level that we want to perform at and we were able to effectuate our ramp to such that we know in 23 and 24, there is no issue with our, our growth uh, patterns you know, at the group. That's what happened with COVID with us. I can't say what happened with COVID with anybody else. So as most of you know, physicians in general did not do well with COVID. Hospitals in general did not do well with COVID, short of the subsidies from the government and even with those subsidies. We gave back our PPE. And you gave back <laughs> your PPE. The bottom line is, is that the, the clinical model was such and the way that the corporation was built and the integration between the finances and the clinical piece could handle a stressor like COVID. I mean, talk about a stress test in relationship to a, a program. COVID is about the, the most significant stress test you can have given the fact that it affected the entire economy. You can't take it all, I'm sorry, but you can't take it all out of profit. So what we did is that we know this is an unbelievable stressor to our staff. 
and everybody, I think everybody knows what happened with staff now and the employment market right now. We have a little issue with the employment market, as everybody does, but what we did during COVID, we gave bonuses out from the low level to the high level, not the physician, of the staff throughout the entire COVID situation, and we forego a lot of the profitability to pass on to our staff because we knew how uh, the issues that we were eventually going to have with the labor market as we move forward. So all I could tell you is that you have to be really careful when you look at your expenses and your profit, and you have to treat people fairly within your company to be able to move forward and succeed. So unlike the 1990s when essentially the physician practice management industry was a, uh, an arbitrage, and quite frankly, even, even then, not a truly legitimate arbitrage, this, this model, the, 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 the summit model and the models that have succeeded summit, looking at summit, uh, truly have created an accretive business that obviously is in the, the multiple billion dollar valuation level and is still owned by a relatively constrained number of investors, largely physicians and the initial private equity people involved and some of the original founding uh, investors who were on the board of directors. Having said all that, as one kind of looks into the future, you're not looking at a company that is being valued at multiples of top line revenue. You're looking at a real company being valued at multiples of real earnings and is certainly sustainable and obviously has, a, I believe, a very, a very rosy or an optimistic future, at least to the degree that healthcare in America has a, an optimistic future.